Hello, my friends. Welcome to the 36th episode of Patterson in Pursuit. I'm your host, Steve Patterson, and Merry Christmas to all my listeners. In the spirit of Christmas, I'm going to be doing an interview breakdown today of a conversation I had with a Christian theologian at the University of Cambridge. And I'm happy to play the part of Scrooge. This is a conversation that I had with Dr. Ian McFarland, who teaches at the University of Cambridge a few months ago. And part of the reason that I like my own version of Christianity is because there's a very high value of truth and a very high value of love. And sometimes this mixture of truth and love comes out as hard truths. And so this is the first breakdown that I've done of any theological interview so far, and I'm going to give you some of my honest thoughts, some reasons why I'm not particularly persuaded by theology in general and some of the issues I have with, uh, in this particular case, this version of Christian theology. So before we dive into it, I want to give you kind of a, a year in breakdown and thank you for everybody that's been listening and supporting the show, sharing it with your friends, enjoying some of the commentary. We're up to over 70 patrons on patreon.com slash Steve Patterson who are demonstrating their support for the creation of a rational worldview. And just a few weeks ago, I started a private Facebook group for patrons, and we've been having some great conversations. And what I've noticed is there's a lot of various opinions in that group, as one might expect. So I get a lot of feedback from people who are uh, radical, aggressive atheists, from people who are radical and aggressive Christians, um, and everywhere in between saying that they appreciate my honest commentary. So I've kind of taken turns week by week of maybe upsetting different groups at a time. I've had several interviews defending and inquiring about Christianity in a very open-minded way, and now I'm a bit overdue for what you might call a, a, an attack on this type of Christian theology, which I think if you value truth and you value love, then you have to be honest. And so here we go. Okay, to start, let me give you some of my thoughts on theology in the abstract, and then you'll see it manifested many times in this conversation in the concrete. One of the biggest issues, maybe the biggest issue, that I have with any theology that I've investigated, I don't really have a good word for it, but it's something like a lot of philosophic clutter. So outside of Christianity, like in Buddhism, for example, you have the, the noble eightfold path, which is eight you know, different ways of uh, achieving nirvana. And in Hinduism, you have, you know, I don't know how many chakras there are, but a dozen different chakras that are all different colors and different locations in your body. In Judaism, Judaism is filled with all the millions of different rules that you're supposed to follow. Each one has its own peculiar significance and justification that's supposed to be a central part of the theology. And I have a very strong repulsion to this kind of philosophic clutter. There's all kinds of, I'll put it this way, there's all kinds of arguments that theologians make that only theologians find satisfying. And if you disagree with some of the foundational ideas, as I always come back to on the show, if you disagree with some of the foundations, then they're just talking. They're just responding to one another. It's like a bunch of arguments and words that are specifically designed and, and hyper myopically focused on arguments that nobody except the theologians make. Like, why is the Noble Eightfold Path eightfold? Why isn't it ninefold? Oh gosh, if you ask, I don't know, a Buddhist theologian, although I'm not just picking on Buddhism here, they're probably actually pretty good on this, but who knows how many hours, how many doctrines and dogmas they're going to invoke to say, no, no, it's got to be the Eightfold Path. It's like, well, I mean, you're just, okay. You're just coming up with a bunch of really complex ideas that you might find internally satisfying, and maybe this very insular peer group finds satisfying, but for somebody outside the system, I just don't find it compelling in the slightest. So that, that way of viewing theology comes up many times in this conversation where he's talking about theologians that have been, you know, talking about Christianity for 2,000 years and using a bunch of jargon that nobody really cares about, doesn't really get at the foundations. It's just satisfying their own criteria for what makes a good argument. And I don't mean to imply that this is exclusive to religion. It's not. I think every part of anybody's worldview has intricacies and, and taxonomy, but it's especially pronounced and noticeable when you're talking about religion and theology. 
So, you know, what does it mean to be sanctified? Oh, well, sanctification means this and this and this and this, and there's this scripture supporting this evidence, and, and this theologian from the 6th century said it was this, and so therefore that's what it means, and this is the standard accepted idea on the topic. And so there's just a million things like that. As we dive into it, I'm going to keep coming back to it. I really need a word for it. Maybe by the end of the show, I'm kind of doing this extemporaneously, maybe the, by the end of the show I'll have some word I can pin down to say, it, ah, that's that ornateness or something. All right, so let's start with the first question. What is or who is Jesus Christ? Is it a person, a human being just like you and me who had really good ideas? Is it a, is it a grand metaphor? Is it literally God who, who came to earth and is now, you know, now walked among us? What is your belief on that? Well, Jesus is a human being just like you and me, which is a very traditional Christian belief, and he is God among us which is also a very traditional belief. <laughs> so uh, both, um, and that's been the, uh, the majority position of Christians since, well, I mean, some might argue implicitly from very, very early on, but explicitly since the fifth century, that Jesus is one person, um, uh, the Son of God, the Word, eternal Word, uh, who is made flesh and thus is uh, in two natures. Okay, hang on a second. This is, this is the first example. These terms, the Son of God made flesh. Okay, what does that mean? I don't know what the Son of God is. Now, I'm sure that means something that to, to, to you know, Christians who believe this theology. I'm sure that's, oh, yeah, Jesus is the Son of God. And that's like, a, that's like an uplifting thing. And that's a central part of the theology. But what does it mean? I don't know what it, that means. Okay, so let's dive into that a, a bit. So the claim is that at the same time, Jesus is... 100% a human like you and me, and also the, is also God, but what does that mean? Is, is the creator of the universe, is, what is it, what are you, when you say he's also God, what is that? Yeah, God okay. is the creator of the universe, the uh, source of all being. Um, in fact, that's, I mean, I think if you look historically, beginning very early by the end of the second century, the the claims for divinity of Jesus, which you get from both early Christian and pagan sources reporting on Christianity, is that uh, Jesus was regarded by Christians as God. Okay, so this is a great, great setup here. Okay, so creator of the universe is synonymous, is the same person, is Jesus. Okay, listen to the argumentation why. The logic behind it is um, if you confess Jesus as Savior, that is the one who can guarantee the integrity of human, and for that matter, any creature's existence against any possible threat, the only being who can have that capacity is God. So to, to claim that Jesus is Savior and not claim that Jesus is God is to engage in, a, in a, a incoherence. Okay, okay. To claim Jesus is Savior. Okay, so it's like we're saying that Jesus is God because we're saying that Jesus is Savior? What? This seems like a very backwards way to go about talking about Jesus being God. Is Jesus God? Yes or no? Yes. Okay, why do we believe that? Well, because Jesus is Savior. Well, okay, what do, what do we mean by Jesus is Savior, and why do we think that Jesus is Savior? This is precisely what I'm talking about. Oh, so of course Jesus is God. Jesus is Savior. It's like, well, that does to, to, to a Christian, that means something. Jesus is Savior. Well, that means something. To somebody who doesn't already, isn't already in the theology, it's like, what? If I were going to argue from my own, you know, pseudo-Christian or whatever you want to call it, my own personal Christian perspective, I would say something like this. You could make a case, a purely rational, philosophic case, to say what Jesus is God means is something like this. There is some type of first cause, let's say it's a creative force, that brought spatio-temporal existence into being, the, the physical existence as we think about it. That creative force requires a mind. That mind like your mind or my mind, has certain properties and certain attributes. And Jesus, for whatever reason, was expressing the mind of God. Jesus had the mind of God. In other words, Jesus was this personification, whether or not he was physically existent or if he's a story, it doesn't really matter. Jesus is a manifestation of love. Love being something which, as I've, I've briefly talked about before, I consider to be divine. So in that respect, Jesus is God. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Jesus has the mind of God. And here's, here's another part, which I is, is again part of my own belief system, is to the extent you can act like Jesus, 
to, to the extent you can act out of love, to the extent you can have that mindset, you are in effect having the mind of God. Wow. So we hear the, all these things, like if you're listening to theology, you have any background in it whatsoever, you hear these terms, mind of God, Savior, sanctification, grace, all these terms that are ill-defined. From a theological standpoint, my disposition is to say, screw them all, they don't make it make any sense. My thought is to say, okay, look, I have personally experienced something which I consider divine, namely love, true love, that requires me to give some kind of ex philosophic explanation for it. Why is it the case that I've experienced this love mindset? And it makes sense, historically speaking, to say, okay, this person, as I read about him, Jesus, what he did and what he said makes me believe that he also had that love mindset. And what he was saying is that love mindset is God. That is that original creative force. Boom. Now we've got a connection between this creative force, the person of Jesus, and the individual who wants to live in accordance with that mindset. So that's my own, you know, super abbreviated theology of trying to answer these questions. I have no idea. My suspicion is to think that this is heresy, that it breaks the orthodoxy, but I don't really care about satisfying the criteria and the framework that the Christian theologians set up. I just don't find their game persuasive. Okay, so I'm getting ahead of myself. Let, let's have him finish that particular sentence. Uh, that, that which is less than God always has at least one other reality, namely God, that could block uh, that being's ability to fulfill the promises that, 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 is, that are made. But the promises that are made, that this is the properties that are of God because he's got to fulfill the promises that are made. Like, I, I don't care about the, prom the promises. Who cares? Now, now we have to justify promises and why we're trying to have promises that are filled so that we can call him savior. I just don't find any of that compelling. I find that in entirety of what the theologian is trying to do with Jesus just useless. So uh, the confession of Jesus as God, is that, that is quite clearly quite early. And I'd argue that its origins are soteriological. Uh, so what, rooted, is that, what does that term mean? That rooted in the in Christian convictions about uh, the capacity of Jesus to save. So on the basis of the confession that Jesus saves, um, it, the inference is drawn that Jesus is God. And then the, then the challenge becomes, well, how can you say that and still uh, confess the one God of Israel and uh, not um, follow afoul of the first commandment uh, and so on and so forth? What? Okay. Who gives a shit about those things? I, I, it's like playing this game, you know, all right, well, we have the Ten Commandments. We have the saviorism that, that we have this person. Well, he meets this criteria, but we're going to throw out, make up a, a word about soteriology or whatever and say, look, we, he is savior, which means then that he must therefore be God. But we have to be very careful so that we don't violate the first commandment, which is that you, thou shalt not have no other gods before me. It's like. Okay, so that's one approach <laughs> to trying to understand Christianity or Jesus or God or love or anything like these. That's one approach. But as somebody who's interested in rational philosophy, as somebody who's interested in you know, clear thinking and not and trying to avoid the framework that other people pose philosophical issues in, I just think, what about this idea? What if we don't care about fulfilling the criteria in like Judaism? Judaism, they've got all these criteria for what the Savior will be. And if you're a Jew, maybe that's relevant. But if you're not a Jew, who cares? If I were somebody who didn't already have the beliefs that I do, though, of course, I'm open to changing them. If I were just investigating, oh, what's this Christianity stuff? And I came across these ideas, I'd be like, move on, you know, swipe left or whatever, right or whatever the heck it is. Serious question, serious question. I don't mean to be mean to anybody or I, I especially Dr. McFarlane. It was very kind of him sitting down and speaking with me. But who, who among you who's not a Christian, I'm speaking to non-Christians out there, who among you listens to this interview, and if you haven't listened to it, go back and listen to it, it's episode 28, who is convinced by this? Who, who listens to this and goes, you know what, I didn't get Christianity before, but now you know that makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah, you know, I was missing that detail of the puzzle. I was worrying, I, I was thinking in my mind, you know, oh, well, how could Jesus be savior and not God, that was the reason I wasn't a, a Christian because I couldn't wrap my head around it. And now, now I get it. You know, oh, that piece of the puzzle is in place. Yeah, I am persuaded by Christian theology. But my suspicion is that there's a big fat zero in terms of the total number, number of people whose beliefs, who are non-Christians, 
whose beliefs weren't budged at all, at, at least in the Christian direction. I can perfectly uh, understand if people were nudged in the opposite direction of like Christian, another demonstration perhaps that Christian theology is playing a bunch of games and doesn't make much sense unless you agree with the way that they set up the issue about trying to argue that Jesus must be God because Jesus is Savior. So when you say Jesus saves, what does that mean? Because I've heard that a lot in my lifetime growing up. Jesus, I've seen it on the billboards too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You were saying you're from, uh, you spend a lot of time in Atlanta and if you drive through some of the highways there, you'll see the words Jesus saves on big billboards. So what, what does that yeah, mean? Yeah, I mean, uh, saving uh, in uh, Abrahamic uh, religions uh, refers to the, again, sort of the, I mean, you know, not, you know, Gold, gold line streets and pearly gates. I mean, what it means is that the the uh, every threat that uh, uh, confronts human existence is defeated by God. So the, I mean, it's 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 a it's a, it's a, um, uh, a confession that's common to Judaism, Christianity, and Islam that God is God saves. Christians also believe that God saves, but they believe that God saves in Jesus. And insofar as they're willing to say that. Um, Jesus is rightly the immediate object of that trust, then it follows that Jesus has to be confessed as equal to God and therefore as God. So that when you're shaking Jesus' hand, you're shaking God's hand, which needless to say neither Jews or Muslims would claim, even though Muslims, unlike Jews, would say Jesus is God's word, but they just don't see um, that as having the same um, metaphysical implications that Christians do. Okay, so the natural question for me would be, what's this, what's this hullabaloo about saving? Why? And I may be, I'm talking out of ignorance here because I don't know the answer to this, so please somebody correct me if I'm off base. Is the only reason that the Abrahamic traditions believe that saving is a thing that happens is because of divine communication? Is it the case that the only reason that Jews set up their framework for what Savior means and all this is because they have a positive belief that God communicated to Moses in the desert. And that's kind of the foundational idea. Is we have this belief that there's this divine communication, that God himself said, I will save you. Therefore, there must be a Savior. Therefore, Jesus is a Savior. Therefore, Jesus must be God. Is that the, is that the line of reasoning? Is that all this comes down to believing that God actually communicated to these people in the desert? Not to say, by the way, I don't want to snarkily dismiss the idea. They may very well be that God communicated to lots of people throughout history. I'm not, I'm not mocking that. I'm just saying it seems very peculiar to me that all of this, the Christian... Uh, you know, the central figure in Christianity is Jesus, and all of it would come down to an assumption that some things that happened in the desert thousands of years ago, in the way that God communicated to some Jews in the desert, means that Jesus is a big deal because he's got to be Savior, so therefore he's God. I, that just seems odd to me. Okay, so then uh, we have a, a quick back and forth about dualism, and my assumption was that uh, Christianity kind of implies uh, dualism, and he was saying, no, that's not necessarily true. So I asked him a question about, you know, physicalism. Is physicalism compatible with Christianity, the idea that everything is fundamentally reducible to spatio-temporality? If it's the case that we go down this route, let's take the, the physicalist um, metaphysics here. What would God's existence be if not in a physical body, like prior to Jesus or maybe after Jesus? If he exists and he's a being, but he doesn't have a body, wouldn't that imply necessarily some kind of dualism? Well, no, because uh, God isn't a thing among God is transcendent, and so you don't uh, God isn't rangeable among the category. What that means is God is not categorizable, right? The medieval quip "Deus non est in genere." Uh, God isn't. Um, uh, an entity alongside other entities, even if you make the scale, you put him at the, him being a loose term, at the top end of the scale. Uh, God is, I mean, the, 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 I think the most um, attractive, summative uh, way of talking about God's transcendence is Nicholas of Cusa's uh, description of God as not other. Um, uh, okay. which, which is not that God is the same, of course, uh, or it's not pantheism, um, but simply that you that uh, God isn't rightly conceived as an entity alongside other entities. And I think that's really the force also of Anselm's argument in the Proslogion, 
um, that what he's arguing is not that perfection implies existence, or as uh, Descartes and Kant thought, um, but that if you're thinking of God, as it were, abstractly in the third person, you haven't really grasped who God is. At that point, you thought of God like a black swan or whatever. I mean, something that you can sort of reflect on as an entity alongside other entities, whereas God is only known in as God makes God's self known to one, as it were, in the second person. Interesting, the Proslogion is, in fact, written in the second person. Uh-huh. Maybe that's the case. I don't exactly know what that means. Well, here's another alternative. Maybe we can say something like God exists. <laughs> if we're to, I, I find it much more rationally compelling to say that God is an existent. It doesn't mean that we're necessarily curtailing God's power. It just means God is something. To, to say, I, I hate the word transcendent, to be honest, though sometimes maybe it can be used carefully. Um, transcendent comes up a lot when you're talking about uh, mathematics, comes up when you're talking about uh, philosophy of mind, comes up when you're talking about theology. And it, from my examinations, transcendent is often synonymous with magic. He's a God is magic. Well, what does that mean? Well, it doesn't really mean anything because you can't really describe it. That's the point of the word, transcendent. I mean, maybe. I just see no reason. I, that, to me, that's a statement that says, reason cannot touch this, therefore we can't say anything else about it. I'm not persuaded by that because I see no reason why I see no reason why reason has these kind of impenetrable barriers. I find it much more persuasive, though maybe it's philosophical heresy or theological heresy, to say God exists if God exists. If he exists, he has properties, and probably means that he doesn't have other properties. For example, he doesn't have logically contradictory properties because those are properties that can't, can't be existent. A lot of times this is where you get crossover with discussions about infinity. People say, well, God is infinite. Of course, in my evaluation, infinite is a similar word to transcendent, the way that most people use it. It's another word for magic. Infinite sets are magic sets, and they have properties that don't make any sense, but that's okay because they're magic. God is infinite which means that God doesn't really make sense, or God might have properties that seem logically contradictory, but that's okay because he's magic, i.e. transcendent, i.e. infinite. Uh, that's okay, we just have to accept it. Or we can have the perspective, which is my perspective, which is say, let's not shut off our rational faculties and accept that our reason has found an impenetrable wall that we cannot possibly get past, we say, hmm, maybe we're thinking about things incorrectly. If we have to throw the transcendent label around, if we have to use the term magic or infinite, maybe it's the case that we've made an error. Maybe we can actually conceive of existent things as being existent things. Now, of course, I have a belief in the existence of God, or I should say I have a belief in non-atheism, and it's really hard to work out the implications of what that implies. So it, I can see an argument to say, you know, we have to be extraordinarily careful where we put the boundaries up around God. But my disposition is to say, okay, let's be careful in doing so, not let's not even try to do so because we use this term infinite or magic or transcendent, which means we shut our minds down and just have faith that we can never conceive of the truth about the nature of the matter. We use words of God because we can't talk without using words, but all our words... Uh, used of God, uh, it, to the extent that they're positive descriptions of God, apply to God only analogically. So to speak of God, for example, as spirit um, is not to say that God is spirit as opposed to matter, as though uh, like creaturely spirits and matter are, but simply to, you know, I think in that case, reflecting on God's incorporeality, God's, it's, it, it has a negative function as an attribute. So. Uh, and I think, incidentally, that's how the incarnation can be made metaphysically coherent, because you're not thinking of God as something, in which case to say that God and, and humanity were in one person would be, at best, a hybrid, not fully both. And to my mind, of course, you know, we, we use the word fully hybrid. That, you know, Christian theologians might balk at that idea that we have some hybrid God and man thing rather than fully God and fully both. But that's a criteria that I just don't care about. It makes absolutely no difference to me whether or not Jesus is a hybrid versus Jesus is fully God and fully man, whatever that means. And again, that's because I reject this categorization of things being important because God is Savior, so we have to preserve the meaning of God being Savior, which implies X, Y, and Z. I just, whatever. I don't share those assumptions, so I don't need to go to those conclusions. 
I think there is some truth here, and uh, and what he's saying is, you no, know, God is spirit. Well, that doesn't mean we've put all of the qualities and metaphysical essence of God together, and what he is is spirit. I agree. I think that would be a mistaken way of trying to conceive about a clear conception of God. But I think it's very easy to slip from, you know, this is not a full metaphysical identification from what God is, into, which I, I think is his position, is there is no metaphysical classification for what God is, by definition, it seems. I don't know, is it, I wonder is, if it's, this is a heresy to say, you know, God exists, or God is an existent. I wonder if that would be considered, you know, an unorthodox heresy, or if people would be comfortable saying that. I really don't know the answer. So I ask him kind of a similar question, and going back to the dualism issue. So if we say that God's existence is... Uh, transcendent. Does that not imply then that there is some type of existence that is uh, non-physical? Well, except that even existence, I think, at that point is being applied analogically. Yeah, some type of existence, but you have to place an awful lot of weight on the some type. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I, mean, it, I mean, because I mean, what, what, you, what, what, we, what, when, what I think transcendence in order to interpret transcendence appropriately, and I think consistently with the way people like Aquinas interpreted it, for example, or for that matter, the Protestant scholastics and Catholic scholastics do, um, it isn't a contrastive category. That's the whole point of the not other in terms of in Kuzanis's thought. Uh, it's not this as opposed to that. It's asking you to break out of the kinds of categories that that uh, cause you to think of things in terms of this or that in competitive or contrastive terms. Okay, but can't we come up with various descriptors of God according to the, the theology that would be in light of this or that? So if we say something like God is transcendent, that means it is not the case that God is not transcendent, right? If we say God is good, whatever that means, isn't that saying it is not the case that God is not good or God is not evil? It seems like by putting any descriptors on, especially if you just are talking about strict logical necessity, you are also putting negative descriptors. Saying, it is true that X means that it is false that not X. This makes me think very much of Eastern ideas, that they say things like, you know, words can't uh, describe the Tao, the eternal Tao. If you're talking about it, you're not actually talking about it because it's non-dualism. It's not this versus that. Is there some similarity there, or is also the Eastern philosophies kind of pointing at the same? Well, I mean, I, I mean, it, it is, I mean, certainly, I mean, Augustine said, you know, if you can understand that it's not God, right? And it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's well established in, in the tradition. Okay, if you can understand it, it's not God. I wish we could give that a little caveat to make it more palatable. Like, if you can fully understand it. It probably isn't God. I would, I would like that a lot more, right? An incomplete definition doesn't mean that this thing cannot have a complete definition. So if God exists, I would say he exists with all of his properties in all of his entirety. Therefore, if, if you had the mind for it, right, if you had literally the mind of God, then you could un fully understand God. Does God understand God? If so, God is understandable. That doesn't mean he can be understood by us or we can understand all of his properties. I'll, I'll, I'll grant some kind of, maybe let's say there's a limitation on our knowledge about it. Sure, let's go that far, but that doesn't mean God is fundamentally ununderstandable. Especially with a mind, he should be able to understand himself. The, I mean, the difference between, I mean, uh, there are lots of differences, I'm sure. An obvious difference with Taoism is that the Tao is not personal. Mm -hmm. um, and the Tao is understood, I think, more like something like the Logos and Heraclitus. I mean, it's an, it's an intra-worldly principle, whereas um, the Abrahamic God is not, is the creator of the world. This strikes me just as a simple inconsistency with what he said prior, saying, you know, we can't say he's this as opposed to something else, but he just said God is creator as opposed to the intra-universal principle of the Logos in Heraclitus. So it seems like we put some parameters about what God is and what he isn't, what properties he has and what he doesn't have. But isn't that putting a kind of a label and a category on him to say he is? Well, yeah, personal? because you can't, because you, you, you can't, I mean, even putting transcendence a category, right? I mean, you can't, you can't <laughs> not do it. The, 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 uh, so in fact, uh, although there's an impropriety always in speaking of God in the third person, language is language and we're st stuck with it. So the question is, how do you, how are you able to honor that um, uh, 
talk about God that way and insist that all terms are applied analogically without simply making that, I mean, that's really, I think, the objection, modern objections to, to theism since the scientific revolution have said, is that, well, if you're not going to use words univocally, then they have no meaning. Uh, and Christians want to say, well, we can't coherently use words univocally of God because that's unfaithful to the kind, to the kind of entity God is or who God is. Uh, so on what basis then do we control our use of language? I mean, um, uh, some people have talked about analogy is, and its proper use is simply controlled equivocation. How do you do that in a way that is uh, responsible and consistent within the frame with, with, that you're working in? All right, well, I'm going to have to side, uh, at least in my disposition, with the Industrial Revolutionists here because I'm, I'm not going to say, you know, we have to have a perfect objective definition for everything. I don't think language works that way. But on the other hand, I'm not comfortable saying, look, we're trying to describe something, but it isn't something. It's this, honestly, it's this mysticism. It's an appeal to mysticism. It's a fundamentally mystery. We're trying to vaguely hint and point at some particular truth, but we can't say it explicitly because that's the nature of the truth. I tend to think, well, look, if you can't say it explicitly, even in, in you know, many words, then it's probably the case that you've made a mistake. The, the mystery is not fundamental mystery of the universe. The mystery is just a function of the imprecision of one's own concepts. If you can sort things out, if you can sort out the puzzle, then you know the, the apparent mystery and paradox evaporates. At least that's the case with every other field that I've investigated. Whenever you get to this, what I would call something like appeal to mysticism or appeal to vagueness of language, it's just a function of the imprecision of thinking. And, and almost universally what happens is you bump up into that vagueness. You see it in people talking about quantum physics. You see it all the time in mathematics. You see it in theology. People say, oh, well, that's the depth. That's the profound ideas are those which cannot be directly stated. So if you're talking about, you know, infinite sets, and is it the case that you can have a whole be the same size as the part of a whole? Yes. Yes, that's possible because infinity, because magic. You say, well, that doesn't make sense. They go, no, no, you don't understand. It doesn't seem to make sense, but that's part of the profundity of it. It's illogical according to your finite logic, but that's why it's so beautiful and so pr profound because it transcends that type of logic. It doesn't make sense on one level, but once you abandon your particular logical parameters, then you'll see the beauty of it. And at this point in my life, even, even though I, you know, I have a, a positive belief in, in God, I have a positive belief in the inaccuracy of physicalism, I just am not persuaded by argument appeals to mystery and vagueness at all. And especially because when investigating religious topics, I think they can be articulated rationally. Like I said earlier, you know, the connection between God, Jesus, and human beings. I've got a pretty dang satisfying explanation for that that doesn't invoke any theology, it doesn't invoke any appeals to scripture, it doesn't invoke any mystery or any ambiguity of language. Pretty dang straightforward and from my perspective, is why I believe it, is way more compelling than any of this. So we can't necessarily reference God uh, because that implies putting boundaries around him, that somehow it's God in contrast to something else. But when bringing it back to Jesus, at that point, we're saying he's God. We can kind of put boundaries around him, right? What I would say is this. You can identify God. You can't define God. You can identify. So what is the nature of that identification? Is it just like a silent understanding? No, it's about saying this is who God is. Um, uh, it's a who question rather than a what question. So, a who question. Uh, um, I mean, again, do I, can I use what words about God? Sure, I'll say that God is good and one and Trinity and various other things, but, uh, but none of those are properly speaking definitional. The essence of God, Christians claim, is ineffable. Okay, so I'll play a little devil's advocate with myself here. The essence of God is ineffable. Well, well, this isn't actually devil's advocate. But this, is, this is a way that I think you can rescue that idea. I could say something about my own essence, right? If you're talking, because I, I, like I've said before, I'm a dualist. I think that my person is not my body. It's something separate. My being is not my body. Therefore, it cannot be physically, spatially, temporally located. It's something separate. So, yeah, my essence, too, is kind of ineffable. But, in fact, I think this... When you understand the nature of how, what language does, I think a great many things are ineffable. Qualia in general, the, the experience of feeling things, or the feeling of seeing red, that's kind of ineffable. You can describe it in certain ways, you can give analogies, you can appeal to your expectation that other people have experienced the same things, but the actual nature of a particular experience 
is not something that can be captured with language. Now, you can tell a story, you can appeal to another mind, but yeah, I would say qualia in general is ineffable. If that's what we mean by ineffable, then I have no problem with that. A great many things are ineffable. But if what is meant by ineffable, which I suspect is the majority of the time, is I can't even talk about it because magic, then how can one be persuaded? To what is one appealing if the way that you gain this understanding is ineffable? But God is the one who called Abraham and brought the Israelites out of Egypt and became incarnate in Jesus of Nazareth. I see. So um, in terms of the metaphysics of the incarnation, um, uh, God's, I mean, Christians claim, and uh, in this, they'd be, in fact, there was a lot of interaction between Christians, Jews, and Muslims in the Middle Ages just on these points. Um, God, when we say God creates, um, we're not simply, in fact, we're not even primarily uh, talking about an originary of, originating event. We're talking about a relation. Okay, we're not talking about an originary event. We're talking about a relation. I don't know what it means. All things have their being insofar as God gives them being. And all things have being only insofar as God gives them being at every point of their existence. So that's the doctrine of creation from nothing, which is Maimonides, uh, the great uh, medieval Jewish uh, theologian philosopher, felt was the one thing that, one doctrine that Christians, Jews, and Muslims held in common. Okay, well, I guess, uh, I guess according to that criteria, I probably would not be either a Christian, Muslim, or a Jew because... I don't think that's necessary. I can imagine a circumstance in which God creates and then doesn't participate in the creation anymore. Or I can imagine a circumstance in where what he said is true, where God creates and then the creation is only sustained in existing by him willing it to be so or something like that. I can perfectly entertain either and I don't see, I don't see the, the reason or the justification for belie having one belief over, over the other. Though my suspicion is it has, again, something to do with some theological claim that they care about. So how does Jesus differ from you or me? Right. Uh, not in the sense that God is any more present in him quantitatively, because God's already maximally present everywhere hmm. uh, as creator. Isn't that mental gymnastics? Why in the world, if we're trying to understand and have any kind of like rational grappling with you know this relationship, Jesus, God, human, why would we say God is no more present in Jesus than he is in me or in a rock? Because we're all creation. It sure would seem like God, the love mindset, as I would put it, the love mind, the creative mind, was a hell of a lot more present in Jesus and maybe even synonymous with the mind of Jesus than us regular blokes. Um, the difference is... Uh... Whereas, and so at one level we can say God is the cause of everything that I do in the same way sort of that Shakespeare is the cause of everything that Macbeth does, right? But Shakespeare is not Macbeth. Uh, the difference with Jesus is that in this one case, this one creature, God relates to this creature in such a way as to say, I, this, this, creature, this creature's life is mine. So in essence, God created himself or an insubstantiation of himself. So we have creator, the God person creating, but being fully a part of his creation in every part of his creation, except one part of his creation, he said, that part's actually me. Or, another hypothesis, that the person of Jesus either found a way himself, as a started as a regular human being and found a way, or started as some kind of you know, divine human being, that was able to communicate, to channel, to be like, to live in accordance with the creative mind. The rock does not have the creative mind. I, in my best moments, in my deepest loving moments, have that creative mind. I ha have, I would, the way that I would put it is, I have experienced the same exact mindset that Jesus had for very short periods of time. And I would say that is ultimately the goal, the, the highest goal of the individual, the highest state of human existence is to be in that state of mind. That state of mind is something that it's been talked about for thousands of years. That is accessible to me, but I don't do it very well. Jesus did it very well, and from the record, it seems to be that he did it all the time. So in effect, because he was constantly in that state of mind, he in effect was God, or, ha or fully embodied the God mind. From the beginning, then, the person of Jesus wasn't 
just like us, and then he kind of became God, or here no, no, he was God was, from the from God conception, yeah. from the very beginning. Yeah. Now, he was God in addition to being just like us. Well, and only in the sense uh, uh, you can use that language if you want to say you're you're Stephen in addition to being like other human beings. If you think, but I, I would not. I want to say that who is a, is a is a uh, catech, is a is a um, ontologically different kind of question than what. Okay, so now we get into some really interesting ideas about the difference between who and what. Who being the person, what being what the person is. Now, in my metaphysics, I think that everything that is existent is a what. It is a something. Yeah, a person is a what. Or maybe I should say, a person has a what. You can't reference persons without referencing a something that is the person. I don't believe that there are existent things which are not what's. But that's actually not his position, so we get into a really interesting conversation here. Well, so when you use the term who, what are you referencing? Because when I think of who, I, I, maybe I'm thinking of what. Yeah, well, that may be what you are doing. And in fact, I noticed, I, I wrote an article on this last year, and uh, one, of my, one of the editors at the journal said, you know, I think here you've actually talked about a who is though or what. I said, oh, you're right, so I changed the <laughs> language. <laughs> um, now, who, I mean, and, and, but it's, it's a crucial distinction. So I mean, you, right. You're, you're right to raise, the, to raise the concern. Who is just that? It's... Who? It's the it's the identity of the person, um, uh, and but, okay, who is something well, only. Person. What is the identity? Though? <laughs> it, it's, like, it's, what is it's, the it's purely deictic. It's it's this it's it's this one. Is there a metaphysical essence to the who? That's what it is. It's the who. That's there's no. If, well, if you make it essence, then you're talking about what. So here's I mean here, the, the, <laughs> right. the. So essentially, he's saying the who is a label that is purely deictic. It's something, it's essentially a word. The who has no what, which leads to a really, really interesting conclusion. So in the Trinity, right? Or the, the doctrine of the Trinity. Right. Uh, what are Christians claiming with that? They're saying there's only one God, and uh, this God uh, is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, if you say, well, what, what, is, a, what is a person exactly? Well, then you're breaking it down because, of course, what Christians want to say is all the attributes of God, wisdom, goodness, holiness, glory, eternity, whatever you want to bring up, uh, all of those are equally shared by all the persons. So who-ness isn't an attribute because if it were, then, you'd, then you would no longer have one God. You'd have three gods, right? Well, who-ness isn't an attribute, but, but when we say... so. It's purely, it's purely deictic. It's purely indexical. You point to someone. I mean, Richard of St. Victor but defined the person as an incommunicable essence of the divine nature, which, as far as I can see, is a fancy way of saying it's something that can't be defined. But when you're pointing at something, you're, st you're still pointing at yeah, something. Yeah, I mean, and this There's is the problem. So, well, so, so I'm pointing yeah. at you. I'm pointing at a bunch of skin and blood and bones and hair and eyes. Um, and yet, I'm, so I'm pointing at only what? And in fact, what you see of Jesus in terms of what's, 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 what, are the, what are the photons bouncing off of, it's all what? It's all created substance. So what do I, and so here's where, we, here's where my dualism gets problematic and where I go with Wittgenstein and Gilbert Ryle over Descartes. I don't infer, however, a who underneath all that somewhere in your pineal gland or whatever, right? Uh, the who is the, one, is the one who, who, is mediated through this stuff, yes. but is not identical with the stuff. Yeah, I can, ag yeah. I can yeah. agree with all that, but does that, if it's the case that the who exists, right? Uh, the who is the one who is you. Okay, the who is the one who is you. Yes, I totally agree with that. However, the, the one who is me still is a something. I'm not just a name. I have a what. I have some type of essence. Otherwise, I couldn't be referenced. I would just be a name. I'm not just a name, or so I think. Um, to say it, I mean, there's no hypothesis apart from its instantiation in a nature. So there's something, so, but, 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 but the hypothesis isn't, a, isn't an attribute in the way that any other, in, in the way that other, it isn't an accident. So when we reference somebody like Harry Potter, right? Yeah. There's, a, there's a who kind of. But yeah, the, but the, fictional, who, but yeah, the who doesn't the who doesn't have a different essence than a you and I who. 
<laughs> no, it's not, no, 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 exactly, because we're the same, I mean, assuming Harry Potter is a, is, a, is a human boy, or young man, or whatever, however old he is by now. Um, uh, yeah, we, have, we, we share our common essence, but we are, di we are differentiated as distinct who's. But we're both, we're all human beings. Yes, but your who, this is, this yeah. is turning English into a very funny sounding yeah, language. Well, uh, your who is different than my who. <laughs> exactly. Okay, okay. Exactly. And, and we have different but, hypostatic properties. I mean, you're, you know, you're maybe, I don't know, you're a little taller than me. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff like but that. But however, yeah. your who and my who are different. I agree with that. Yeah. But they share some quality that Harry Potter's who does not. Well, yeah, Harry Potter, Harry Potter isn't a real person. Yeah. So I love that. That's like the, the, the best philosophic sentence ever. Your who is different than my who. Well, it's true. And this is the point that I'm making, that Dr. McFarlane has a who. I have a who. Harry Potter sort of has a who. There's a difference between all of the who's. He and I share something that Harry Potter does not, and that is a what. Harry Potter does not have an independent existence. We are distinguishable from Harry Potter as we're not fictional objects. We have independent existence. We are an independent what? But yeah, okay, so but, if you're but, using but who, the, so, if you're talking about fictional characters, the who's analogical. I mean, there's no, I can't murder Harry Potter. But, but, what, I'm, but that, <laughs> yeah. what I'm saying is there is a metaphysical essence to a who. There has to be, because if we can reference Harry Potter as a who, but he doesn't have that essence, and you and I actually have the essences. Well, Harry Potter doesn't have a human nature. So there's so, so he doesn't so have a what kid. he doesn't have a what exactly. he doesn't have a body. So yeah, I'm happy to say all who's are instantiated as what's. There's no free floating who. A who is always a particular a kind of who. It's you know but, it's Gabriel what about the God? angel who or but God is a who, right? God is three who's in fact, or yeah, three hypotheses. But but, uh, but only one what, which is different. <laughs> Do you guys follow that? Because I didn't. That seems contradictory to me. And what's really interesting, uh, and I find this when examining any worldview or any philosophy, really any claim, is you know you have this edifice of knowledge, and then packed into that edifice, really deep down near the fundamentals, you get into some of these ideas, where at the beginning of this conversation, I never would have thought, nor probably would anybody, that a central part of all of this, his particular theology is the distinction between who and what. It's essential. If if this what we're talking about right now, if this isn't fleshed out, if this, if what his claims are are inaccurate, then a great deal of all of these claims fall apart. And I would say, I think he's completely mistaken because as we're about to get into a conclusion I find patently absurd, and therefore how much of this theological edifice should just be thrown in the garbage can because it, I, the, the conception in that theology is that who's and what's have this different interplay between them that I, I think is wrong. But I, I, I don't want to get you, into that. I thought thought you, you, yeah, go ahead. I thought you implied before that, that God doesn't really have a what, because that implies... Well, yeah, I mean, the, the, to talk about divine nature, you've got to put it in quotes, yeah. Okay. And in fact, and I think that's one thing that's, is, I think that's important, is that I, I would want to, I know this is getting, going to get us way, would get us way off, but just put it as a parenthetical mm -hmm. comment. Uh, no, 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 it's not going to get us way off. And I'm afraid this is another thing that I notice when having conversations, not just with professional intellectuals, but everybody, is when you start getting, this is, this is the central part of the whole conversation, where it gets like red hot, wowie, here it is. And then he goes, well, you know, I don't want to really get into that. Well, you know, we're going to be dra dragged down a rabbit hole. It's like, no, no, my suspicion is that you see you just contradicted yourself because you said God is three hoes and one what? And I said, wait, earlier you said God had no what? And he said, well, I mean, yes, I mean, you got to kind of put the what in quotes and then we're moving on. That smacks of logical, explicit contradiction. I think that we are who's only insofar as God addresses us as who's. That well, is, well, we're, we're treated as we are. We are. We are treated as persons by God, and that's the that's how we become. Sim not simply because a who isn't simply an individual. This is an individual instance of a chair. It's not a who. Right. Right. This is still about metaphysics, which is what I want to talk about. So sure, I do want to sure. ex explore this. So what, here's my own personal worldview: that the chair is has a. So what we're, what we reference when we say chair hmm. is bits of matter that are arranged in a particular way that we call a chair. There's no fundamental chairness that's out there that's substantiated. It's just really a concept. It doesn't mean that the bits of matter don't exist, but the chair is just a concept. That seems to be different than when we're talking about beings. There seems to be something else there. So what I would say is if there were no minds, there would be no chairs. You'd still have bits of matter, you wouldn't have chairs. If there were no 
minds, there were no conceptual identification of things. You would still have people, you would still have beings, right? Uh, yeah, you would have individual human entities, yeah. So this part I agree with, you, you'd still have human entities, but... But what I, want to what I want to emphasize is that soul is not who. Soul, if soul is part of your what, that is human beings are made of body and soul, then that's part of your what. The who uh, strikes me as a name then, if we're saying yeah, the who it's, is it's not what. it's fundamentally who is about name. But it's not simply, I mean, obviously I can give the chair, I can call the chair Matthew, it doesn't <laughs> make it a who, right? So, that's, so what, what makes finally human beings who's, um, uh, for me, uh, in terms of my theology, is that God calls us in Jesus, as Jesus, to be in communion with the divine who's. And so it's, a, so it's, a, it's at that point that our, that our it's that, it's that's, what it, that's when we understand fully what it means to be a human being and to be a who. Now does that a mean? A human who. Let's imagine. divine who's. All right, so this is kind of the setup for what I consider to be the central flaw in his theory. Let's imagine a world in which there were no names. We didn't have names. Would there still be who's? Um, I guess I'm trying to figure out what would that, because uh, to be a, to be, uh, for me, to be a who is precisely to be called by name. And obviously, what one makes, you know, how we could, could there be nonverbal names? Right? But, uh, Let's just say there were no names. There was no, uh, there was no identification of what? It was. Yeah, well, in that case, I, don't, I mean, I'm not, I'm, uh, I, I think then you're saying, yeah, there are, you're, 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 that would be the, to define it as being there would be no who's. <laughs> Okay, ridiculous. I'm sorry, that's just completely ridiculous, and I think a demonstration of where this theory is wrong. So he's said in that segment that one, which I think is a contradiction, he said, I could call a table or a chair a who, I could call it Matthew, but that doesn't mean it's a person. If that side note is true, that implies that the who, the person, lacks the whatness of the who. So the reason that a table doesn't become Matthew, a person, is because it doesn't have that metaphysical essence of a person. So that would be my point. And then it, it concludes with something I found flabbergasting when I said it at the moment, but I tried to be polite. Said, is what you're saying that the who is identical with the name? Yes. Does that mean that if God didn't name anybody in a universe without names, there would be no who's. And he goes, well, I, 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 well I, yeah, I guess that's what you'd be saying. Okay, now that, then therefore your idea is silly because he's literally saying that what it means to be human is to be named. To be named is to be the human. The human person, the human being is a name and God gives us a name and therefore we're a human being. I see no reason to think that this is true, that this even makes sense, that this corresponds with any of our experience. The only way that I think it, the only worldview puzzle into which that idea fits is something that is radically, I would say, dogmatically theological, where there's some, there's supposed to be some profound truth to say, wow, what it means to be a human is to be named by God. Oh my goodness, that means something profound. I think it's utterly ridiculous. Obviously, you are a something, you are a person, and what you are, your essence, the reason that you are something different from a table called Matthew, if your name is Matthew, you're the human called Matthew, is because you have a what that is separate from your name. And though I'm sure this comes across as strong, and oh, I'm going to push, push fellow interviewers away, look, I don't care. The purpose of this podcast is to accurately communicate my own pursuit of truth, my own evaluation about these arguments as I encounter them, and this one, in fact, I even did a video on Facebook after I was done with this at Cambridge, I thought this is, this is utterly ridiculous. Here's this guy, I'm sorry, this is nothing personal, absolutely nothing personal. This is something about the structure of academia and the way that humans operate. Here's this guy at Cambridge, and a professor at Cambridge, who's got his own office, you know, who knows how many classes he teaches, supposed to be some intellectual, some, in, you know, some influential person in the history of, you know, Christian philosophy or Christian theology, and all, all of his massive amounts of knowledge. I mean, he has, you know, a thousand, more probably 10,000 times as much knowledge about the history of Christian philosophy and Christian philosophic ideas than I do because he's read immensely more than I am on the topic. All of it comes down to this idea. This idea of the distinction between the who and the what is utterly central to his Christian theology. And it comes down to a positive belief 
that if God had not named you, if you did not have a name, you would not exist because the entirety of human existence is having a name. The name is what you are. Now, this is one of the reasons that people get pushed away from theology in general. This is not unique to Christian theology at all. This is the reason that people get pushed away because you, you bend over, a lot of theologians bend over backwards and say really remarkable and outlandish things. And then you get, you know, they kind of get pushed up against the wall. There's some idea like this and, and out, my dad used to do this all the time when I would talk to him about theology, outspurts an absurdity that somehow, somehow still treated as like a respectable idea as like, oh, well that's, yes, that's a central part of Christian theology is your entire essence is your name. Did you, were you not to have a name, then you wouldn't exist. It's like, oh yes, of course. Now, that was a rant. I apologize for Dr. McFarlane. He's listening to this. He's totally justified in sending me a nasty email. Um, but this is my honest evaluation of the ideas. I find it utterly absurd. Now, that's not to say I, uh, I, in any way that all theology is absurd, that all, you know, that, that there's no good apologetics out there. I don't mean to imply that, but this, I think, is uh, an excellent example for everybody to see where apologetics and theology goes awry, because this is somebody teaching at Cambridge who knows more than, you know, factually knows way more than your average, uh, you know, pastor can talk circles around them, and yet this is the kind of ideas that you get. But that's where I should end it on this very uh, happy Christmas edition. I'm sure I've offended a lot of people. In a sense, it gives me, I'm obviously angered um, by these ideas because I find them preposterous, but it gives me encouragement because this is an open field, right? I'm seeing, uh, it's like if I were a chess player and I you know, surveyed the field of the competition and all of them were throwing chess pieces at one another and they didn't know how to move the pieces on the board, I would think, okay, this is an opportunity I can step in and, and get some you know, good, good chess done. I feel the same way about theology. <laughs> Right, as somebody who believes in God, a radically different conception than maybe standard orthodoxy, I find it a very ripe field for being able to bring rationality, logic, common sense, and a, a very anti-dogmatic, anti-establishment, um, unorthodox approach to some ideas which at the very core I think there are some of the most important truths in the world. You know, I, I, I will say, on the one hand, I will say what I have said about this Christian theology and this manifestation of it. On the other hand, I sincerely believe that for human beings, some, you will find some of the most profound and important ideas of all time with the writings uh, and the recorded writings of Jesus. So there's a lot of work ahead. And I'm glad to have you guys along for the ride. If you appreciate this kind of commentary and you would like not only for there to be more interviews like this, interview breakdowns like this, but also you'd like to see some of my own ideas on the topic. So you want me to talk more about my views on, on Christianity or on religion or on God in audio format or article format, you can show and demonstrate your support by going to patreon.com slash Steve Patterson and becoming a patron of the show and a patron of the creation of a rational worldview. I know there's a lot of people out there, because I get your guys' emails, that think similarly to me, that you see the truth of, of, uh, of what a lot of religions are getting at, but you're nauseated by the academic jargon and ridiculous obscurity of most theology. I know you guys are out there, so let's band together. Let's try to create someday, not in the near future, but someday, something akin to a rational theology. All right, that's all for today. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. I hope it made you uncomfortable and challenged you in a way that you value. And I will talk to you next week.